Good morning, Shiloh Ranch Church Online. Levi, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm fantastic. It was just Christmas time. Yeah. So that was fun. We had a great time here for the Christmas Eve service. That's uh, my favorite service of all time. Same. So um, comment below, how was your Christmas time? What, uh, I don't know, what's a, your favorite memory from this last Christmas? Yeah. Yeah. We're about to uh, launch into worship right now. Um, feel free to stand, sit, worship with us as you like, and uh, we'll be back right after. So see you soon.
Yeah, God, we just thank you again for this day. God, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on our behalf. God, we know with the dawn comes your redeeming grace. So we just ask for your love and your mercy and your grace every single day. We love you. Amen. We are back, and we're about to go into the sermon. This week's sermon is an archive, so one from the books. Um, I always like going into archive services because I've seen them before. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe some of you haven't, but it seems like every time you watch one, you get something out of it again because uh, it just means a little bit different. Yeah. So uh, so we're going into the sermon, then we'll have worship, and then we'll be back here to sign you guys off. So Awesome. We'll see you then. Um, one of the things that seems like is kind of universal, and I don't know, maybe not everybody, um, young people, if you're here with your families, um, maybe you'd say that this is not you, but f- I would say maybe for the masses, one of the things that people share around Christmas time is that in everything we got going on is kind of the wrap up of the year. Thank God. Um, you know, that we want to just sort of wrap up the year with like a good feeling, like a family feeling or a feeling like, like I would say that average person on the street might even describe it as some sort of like a religious experience, just something to sort of, you know, we come to church, maybe we're not sure what we're asking or what we're hoping to get out of it. But one of the things that just has really been driven home in my life this year, and, and you'll see evidence of this everywhere that Shiloh Ranch exists, is that the most deeply, when I say religious, please understand, I'm saying in a broad sense, the most deeply religious experience that we will have, Jesus says, that is when we love each other. That if you want to know what it's like to operate the closest to the heart of God, it's when we serve each other, it's when we love each other. And so it's not a matter of getting away from people and having this mountaintop experience where God just chooses to love us. That's part of it. But you'll know that you're having a Jesus moment when you reach out and you start to love people that maybe otherwise you wouldn't have interest in. And so uh, I think the best, the best sermons are sermons that are observed, not taught. For the record, I realize I can't get up here and demonstrate a sermon. I'm going to have to preach it. But I hope that what you see when you pull in, when you see the stack of logs, when you see the cattle, when there's, you know that we're like 65 tons of hamburger that we've given away through the 1017 Project. We started, yeah. You know, there's a reason why I'm, I'm flexing on this a little bit. There's also a giant stack of logs. And when we started a firewood project a few months ago, everybody had the same question. You want to know what it was? That sounds great, but guess. Where are you going to get the wood? We're like, we don't know. We'll just build a pit. And maybe Jesus will do something. I am loving the fact that in 2020, the ground has shaken under us in a way that we've never experienced. In your lifetime, in my lifetime, the world has changed in a way that we can't grasp. And for the first time, people are considering Jesus in a new way where they're not going, okay, I get it. They're going, wait a minute, there's, el- there's elements and aspects of life that will change. There's a, a guy, and I'm not gonna say names, there's a guy today that, that could very possibly lose his business because of all of what's going on. Uh, it's a very real, possi- very real possibility. I pull up today and he's out throwing logs in the dump trailer because he's going to bring it to somebody that doesn't have firewood. And he- here's why I'm saying all that. That I want, I want to be very clear. The demonstration of the heart of Jesus has got to be seen. I can tell you what to look for, but until you see it for yourself, then it's just words on a page. And I realize that. So I'm not going to sit up here and assume I'm going to change your mind. So if it feels like I'm trying to convert you, of course I am. <laughs> But I'm also realistic enough to know that God's got to do something in your life and that when you will consider a God that drives people back towards people and back into love, you know, there's a reason that we don't celebrate Christmas by avenging all of our enemies. You go, well, that's silly. Why would that be any different? If that was the heart of God, if that's how we had to honor Jesus was to go get revenge, if that would have been his nature, Christmas would have been a very bloody holiday. Like, man, this is a weird Christmas service. I promise you it's getting... Matthew (laughs) chapter two says this, thought I was lying. Listen to this. When they had gone, this is the Christmas story, but it's part that people don't read as much. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up. He said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until you, until I tell you for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. That means that Jesus was an immigrant for a lot of his formative young years. 
And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Verse 16, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Bear with me, it's going to go dark just for a minute, but I promise we'll pull back up out of it. The story of God's love and God's redemption has always had this dark human element where people suffered and there was suffering associated with it. If you think the story of Jesus is this wonderful, great story, talk to Mary when you first get to heaven and ask her how how joyful the story of Jesus was. And the story of Jesus starts with mothers burying their children. See, it's so much easier to consider the concept of Jesus with like Christmas lights and jingle bells and all the stuff that goes with it. But you got to understand that when you go through a dark time, you're not outside the realm of Jesus. You're actually probably closer to it. You're not further from Jesus in your struggle. You have an element of Jesus that you're closer to in moments of struggle because struggle followed the life of Jesus. And I think the church has done a very poor job of demonstrating what it means to follow Jesus because if it feels like that we're far from Jesus when we reach struggles, we haven't read all of the story. The tragic irony of all this is that had Herod offered his throne to Jesus, Jesus didn't want it. Children lost their lives to protect a throne that wasn't under threat. A king protecting his own throne and his own little space and his own life and his own authority. So here's my question. Here's the basis of where we're going to go tonight. Here's the question is that if we had a chance to talk to Herod, if we could sit King Herod down, knowing what we know now about Jesus, and we could talk to him with the hopes of sparing the lives of children, and we were to go, Herod, hold on. There's some things that you need to know about Jesus. There's some things you need to know about him because if you knew these things, maybe you would think of him differently. That if I could explain to Herod the nature of Jesus or the purpose or the mission of Jesus, that maybe Herod would relent and realize his authority is not what Jesus came for. And actually, if Jesus is God, his authority is not what Jesus even needed. It's almost laughable to think that Herod thought he could protect it from Jesus anyway. A man so rich that he wasn't interested in what Jesus was offering because he was trying to protect what Jesus might ask for. First, first thing I think I would start, I've thought about this, and I know this is kind of a backwards Christmas theme, but like I said, I hope it gets better. And if not, we're only going to be here for a little while longer. <laughs> Herod, assume you did it. Assume you accomplished it and you killed Jesus. Then what? Let's say that you had accomplished what you'd set out to accomplish and you'd killed Jesus. Nietzsche was a philosopher and atheist. If you're on the fence and you're like, I don't know about Jesus, I don't know about church, good news, both sides presented tonight, just something to consider. Nietzsche was an atheist, he was a philosopher, and he wrote this, and it's long, but if you'll bear with me, I'm going to read you the whole thing. It's called The Madman. It says, have you not heard of the madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace and cried incessantly, I seek God, I seek God. Keep in mind, this is written by an atheist. He had an entire theory about the concept of God, and this is how he told it. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Has he got lost, one asked. Did he lose his way like a child, asked another, or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage, immigrated? Thus they yelled and laughed. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Whither is God, he cried, I will tell you, we have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers, but how do we do this? kind of brilliantly written when you stop and listen about this guy considering the concept that God is no longer present, that the power or the authority of God is absent because we as people have progressed beyond the concept of God. He says this, how did we do this? How could we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun, whether it is moving now, whether we are moving away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually backward, sideward, forward in all directions? The concept of a missing God. Is there anything up or down? Are we not straying as through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is it not night continually closing in on us? Do we not need to light lanterns in the morning? Do we hear nothing as yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Again, the question would be, Herod, what happens if you accomplish your mission and you were to kill Jesus? What would happen? 
Do we smell nothing as yet of the divine decomposition? God's too decomposed. God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we confront ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all the world that yet owned has bled to death under our knives? Who will wipe this blood off of us? See, now it's saying, okay, so if God is gone, then what do we do with that? If we were to eliminate the concept of God from our lives, if we were to walk out tonight and decide that God is not the option for us, we are then confronted with new questions. There are new questions that have to be asked. This in internal struggle that we face, which is to say, okay, if we say that there is no God, sometimes we can ignore what we are also saying, but I think it's good that we consider, if not God, then what? And that's where Nietzsche goes at this point. What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatest of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? There has never been a greater deed, and whoever is born after us, for the sake of this deed, he will belong to a higher history than all history hitherto. Here the madman fell silent and looked against his listeners, and they too were silent and stared at him in astonishment. At last he threw his lantern on the ground, and it broke into pieces and went out. I've come too early, he said. My time is not yet. This tremendous event is still on its way, still wandering. It has not yet reached the ears of men. Lightning and thunder require time. The light of the stars require time. I'm reading to you the words of an atheist on a Christmas service. The light of the stars still require time. Deeds, though done, still require time to be seen and heard. This deed is still more distant from them than most distant stars, and yet they have done it to themselves. It has been related further that on the same day the madman forced his way into several churches and there struck up his requiem, led out loud and called to account. He is always to have replied nothing, but this is to the churches. What after all these are churches now if they are not tombs and sepulchers of God? The thought being this, that if Herod would have succeeded and God were to be wiped off of his throne, then what are we left with? That when you walk out, even if God's not wiped off of the eternal throne, what if God's just blotted out of your authority in your life? What if in your life you were to walk out and go, God is something to consider, but his authority is something to reject? What if the authority of God is something that you fear will have a restricting effect in your life? And what Nietzsche brings to light is that if you say no here, you are saying yes somewhere else. Ravi Zacharias says it this way. He says, if God is dead, people become God. Bodies become spirits, and time becomes eternity. Now, here's why this is all scary. Because Nietzsche's suggestion was we've progressed as people, we've advanced, we've evolved, we are now beyond the concept of God. It's up to us to be God. And that was the teachings that Stalin brought forth during the Great Purge. It was also the teachings that Hitler brought forth during the Holocaust. Here's why. Here's why. It's not because it's intrinsically evil, but because without God, nothing is intrinsically evil. It's just preferable. If God's taken out of the equation, then we get to decide amongst ourselves what's right and what's wrong and what makes somebody else's right more right than mine. What Nietzsche did accidentally was he uncovered the depths of humanity, which was to say at any cost, if we can capture the position of God, then it's up to us to decide morality. Morality. What he miscalculated was how badly we need an authority that goes beyond that of our own. And we see that as Herod is putting babies to death to preserve his own authority, that when God is taken out of the picture, there is no longer the presence of evil or righteousness, and I can prove it to you. The only way that humanity is of value is if Jesus says so. Otherwise, it is literally just nature. When a coyote catches a gopher across the pasture, do we say the coyote's evil? We can't. There's no value assigned to that. But when people harm each other, we say that's intrinsically evil, and we don't understand that apart from God's presence, we are all Herod, killing whoever we need to kill to preserve our own authority. You can't, apart from God, even say that people like Hitler and Stalin were evil. The second question that I would ask Herod would be, let's assume you were free from God's authority. 
Let's just say that today, and, I, and, I, and I'm not saying that this is what our hearts desire, but at least let's consider both sides. Let's at least consider why we believe what we believe so that we'll understand what we're rejecting if we say no. Because something you'll learn around here is there's no forced believing. No amount of force can cause you to change your heart. That's literally yours to deal with. That is your choice. I just want to at least present an argument so you'll know what you're saying yes or no to. Is that fair? The rich young ruler approaches Jesus and he goes, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And God goes, well, you gotta be really, really good. And he's like, I'm really, really good. And Jesus goes, no, no, really, really good. And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm really, really good. He goes, okay. Then I need to know who you are apart from your own authority. I need to know, this is what Jesus is asking the rich young ruler. He goes, you need to have an, ad an identity apart from being wealthy. There is no you anymore. You are the rich young ruler and there is no you. You are a title, you serve in a role, you have wealth, but you have been lost. And the only way that I can save, this is Jesus, the only way I can save you is to separate you from what you draw your identity from. So I guess that would be my question to Herod. Herod, who are you if the throne was taken from you? And he would say, I'm nothing. What choice did Herod have? I'm a father, I'm a dad, I'm, what, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat. All of these things that we assign ourselves an identity, but apart from God, the problem is we begin to disappear into our roles and into our titles until there's nothing of us left. It is God's authority alone that draws our identity out apart from the titles we give ourselves. Mark chapter 10, as the rich young ruler walks away, because the rich young ruler says that apart from me, I don't want to live. Apart from my own authority, I don't want to live. The rich young ruler says, if I'm not rich, life is not worth living. And we all have those things. We all have those little things that we say, apart from that, life is not worth living. And we don't see that by separating us from those identities, Jesus is offering us freedom. It's his authority that's offering us freedom, not restriction. But if it's the thing we value the most and we preserve the most, then God presents himself as the utmost threat. Mark chapter 10, 25 said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. It's a whole thing. It's a gate. Well, we'll talk about it later. And they were even more astonished and they said, then who can be saved? This is that moment where you get to Jesus and you go, I was a really good guy. And Jesus goes, it's not good enough. And he goes, how good do I have to be? And Jesus' answer is, well, perfect. <laughs> I thought I was close. That means not only do I have to be good moving forward, I have to somehow have gone backwards and fixed everything I've done wrong. And they're asking what we would ask. Jesus, who can be saved? Jesus says, with people, it is impossible but not with God, for all things are possible with God. So I would go to Herod and I would say, Herod, you gotta consider that Jesus is offering freedom, that by trying to kill him, what you're doing is you're signing your own death sentence that says you will never be free from the restrictions that have you bound up. C.S. Lewis said this, says hell begins with a grumbling mood. Now, listen, everybody that I know that doesn't trust God doesn't trust God on the basis of hell. That's their one indictment. I can't believe that God would send people to hell. And we've got these widely ranging varieties of what we believe hell to be. And C.S. Lewis describes it this way. And I'll tell you, I subscribe to this thinking. Hell begins with a grumbling mood, always complaining. You ever know anybody like this? They have a, they have a problem for every solution. <laughs> hell begins with a grumbling mood, always complaining, always blaming others. <laughs> nope, nope, don't but you're still distinct from it. You may even criticize it in yourself and wish you could stop it, but there may become a day when you can no longer. Then there will be no you left to criticize the mood or even enjoy it, but just a grumble itself going on forever like a machine. It's not a question of God sending us to hell. In each of us, there's something growing which will be hell unless it's nipped in the bud. That means this, the more that we attach ourselves to our own authority, the more of us is lost into this role and into this identity that is not the identity given to us by God until eventually there's nothing left. Have you ever known somebody so lost in their drug addiction that who they were is gone? They're completely out of their mind and what you see is the human personification of addiction and what you realize is they submitted themselves to the wrong authority. Herod, who could you be apart from Jesus? 
Because no matter how tightly you cling, you can't hold on to this tr throne until eventually you disappear. The throne remains and you're gone. I don't think hell will be where people get sent. I think hell will be for those who chose it. And think of this. What could be more just than someone choosing to be separate from God and God finally relenting? What else could we ask of him? Everything that we see in the word is God calling and calling us and calling us and calling us and deeper and deeper and deeper. And it says finally that God will relent and allow us to choose our authority. And eventually we are given what we have asked for, which is nothing but separation. Until eventually we're so disintegrated that who we were is completely lost. Only it never stops. And that's what eternity in hell looks like. I would take fire over that. Here's my favorite one. This is the third point. I cannot tell you how proud I am of myself having a three-point sermon on Christmas. <laughs> Jasper Weaver is proud somewhere in heaven. This is the Christmassy part. Now that we understand the depths of what we are facing, then the story of Christmas has to come to light because now we understand what we are up against. Now we understand that, that without God, we become the authority. And if we become the authority, all truth is subjective. There's no such thing as evil. There's nothing we can do to indict each other or say that there's righteousness or evil if God is dead. But if God's alive, we have something higher than ourselves to appeal to. If God were to turn us loose, we eventually disintegrate and disappear into whatever we've chosen. But the third point is this, is let's assume there's a reason for Christmas. I would say, Herod, have you not considered that maybe there's a reason why Jesus were to just happen by? And there are shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. Now it feels like a Christmas service, doesn't it? Don't worry, I'm a professional. I know exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified because God's authority is not something to be just casually observed. It says when God's presence was there, the authority of who God is, the truth of what God says about himself and the universe was terrifying. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. That, that alone could be the sermon, is that it is something terrifying, but the nature of God goes, but it's okay. I'm not safe, but I'm good. We don't want a God that's safe or controllable. Thank God that he's not a politician that needs our support or our approval. Do you realize that if you were to go to God and go, eh, that's not how I do it. God, let me tell you what I would do. God's like, you are adorable. <laughs> He's not safe and he doesn't need your approval. He didn't get voted in. He's not hoping that in four years we'll like him again. He goes, I'm God. So when he says, don't be afraid, that's a reflection of his nature. He goes, you could be, but in this case, you don't need to be. I'm on your side. Here's my question, why? Think of this, what leverage do we have? We can't vote him out. If we were to all disappear, just like an ant pile, if you were to go out and just decimate an ant pile, it's not like you're gonna lose sleep at night because of the value of the ant. There is a measurable gap between humans and ants. There's an immeasurable gap, an impossible to measure gap between us and God. God could eradicate us and who's gonna hold him accountable? So when God says that he loves us, we're like, why? So Herod, think of this. If Jesus is here, why? He's not here to take something from us. He doesn't need anything from us. Can I say that again, people? He doesn't need anything from you. So this idea of like, hold on, God. I, you know, I, I'm a, I'm, I believe in God. I mean, that's a good start. But if your concept of God is, hey, yeah, 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 I got it. I, I believe in God. God, you stay over there in your lane. I got some things I'm working on. <laughs> Why? Why did he come to us? Whose authority 
compelled God to send Jesus as a baby to be born into suffering, to go through all sorts of suffering so that we could be redeemed, so that the chasm, the chasm between separation from God and redemption to God could be pierced. Why did he do that? And I know I'm probably oversimplifying the idea, but I hope when you leave that the idea of God is not, he wants you to be nice so that he can be more God, like you brighten his star somehow. <laughs> the baby tells us about the nature and the compassion and the heart of the Savior. Because let me tell you, there's nothing you were gonna do to force him to do anything. He's God. And if he's not, we're in trouble. John chapter 10, 18 says, no one, this is Jesus, they said, you realize that if you don't do what we want, we're gonna put you on the cross. We're in a sermon series right now called Flex, and this is the ultimate flex. God says, Jesus says, that's not how this works. You're not taking anything. This is Jesus. This is the Jesus that was born at Christmas. He goes, you're not taking anything from me. He says, no one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. Whose accord? His accord. Based on whose authority? Not ours. So this idea of keeping God at a distance, if you think about it too long, the problem is you run into an intellectual impasse where you go, you know, maybe I don't believe in God at all, but if I do, then the way I believe in him doesn't make sense. I am an intellectual liar if I think that God exists and he's something to be held at arm's distance. He's one or he's the other. At least we could be honest about who we believe him to be. I have authority to lay down my life and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. <laughs> Ready for the worst part of this whole sermon? In 2020, even with all that we're facing and all that we're going through, you still live a better life than Herod did. There's nothing I could ask Herod that doesn't also apply to who we are today. What happens if you kill God from the authority in your life? What are you left with? What if God doesn't hold authority in your life? What are you left with? It's not that authority disappears from your life. It's that you place it somewhere else, but you place it somewhere that's a lot more shaky. Freedom is something that has to be given. And when we say that we don't want to appeal to the authority of God, it's that we don't trust the nature of God because we don't understand that we didn't ask God to come down. God volunteered it. And I'm gonna tell you, the problem is this. In the same way that Herod tried to kill Jesus, we do the same thing when we go, yeah, but I don't wanna be like a Jesus freak. I'm not, I don't wanna be on as a religious fanatics. If it helps, neither do we. <laughs> It's like a really, really high value that we carry that we don't want to run around with sandwich boards and scream about how people are going to hell. So if you're doing that, please make sure that Shiloh Ranch is nowhere on any of your material, please. But if you stop and think about it long enough, I think that there are conversions There's just nothing more powerful than someone's mind changing. The world gets better when people change their minds and when they begin to choose the nature of God. And that's not to say, okay, I got it. I got all the answers. It's at least to say, my version of God can't be true. And the authority of God is not something to be avoided. His authority, it says he laid down his authority for who? Us. So that when we begin to lean into the nature of God, what we find is that everything that God is has been assigned in our favor. That he called us sons and daughters and he doesn't call us in to restrict us. He calls us in to bring our, bring our identity out of all the things that held us in bondage. To give the rich young ruler a name that is not connected to being rich or young or a ruler. An identity that is free of the titles that we place on ourselves. I couldn't ask Herod anything that I couldn't ask you, which is to what benefit do we kill God in our lives? If you were to walk out and say that God is going to be pushed to the margins, at least consider the question, what are you going to replace it with? If God's out, what's in? And then from the bottom of my heart, I would encourage you, live fully in that. 
whatever the case may be, at least enjoy the life of the choices that you've made. But know that God is not here because we demanded it or because we voted him in or we could vote him out. The nature of God is that he showed up when he showed up on behalf of a, of a people that were helpless without him. Let's pray. Lord, I used to believe that there was a official steps and things that we had to say. And God, I've met people who just laid on the floor of their apartment, strung out on drugs that would say nothing more than if you're real, I need to know who you are. God, the simplicity of a heart that says, I'm tired of running my own life. I'm tired of calling my own shots. I'm tired of avoiding you. God, a heart that says, I just want to say yes, and I don't even know what I'm saying yes to. God, my prayer tonight is that we consider what I would have encouraged Herod to consider, which is, what does it look like if we say no? God, that when Nietzsche introduced the idea of God being dead, it opened the door to all sorts of atrocities because it removed higher morality. God, we need a concept of love. We need a God that we celebrate Christmas by loving each other. We celebrate your birth by leaning into each other and giving gifts and loving each other and trying our best in our flawed, dysfunctional ways. God, we try our best to demonstrate the nature of you. God, that when we go home, that we overlook imperfections in each other. We overlook the little annoying habits that every family has. That God, that's what Christmas does, is that we begin to reflect the nature of God that chooses love over judgment. With heads bowed and eyes closed for a second, let me just encourage you with this. If you're here and you'd say, I need to reconsider who God is in my life. I've held God at a distance and it doesn't really make sense why and I don't want to necessarily be a part of a club or a group. I, I get it. I'm the most claustrophobic person you'll ever meet. But separate from every club or entanglement or human restriction based solely on you and the creator, just a relationship between you and the Jesus that you don't even know everything about yet, here's what I would encourage you to do. Begin to ask him to show himself to you in a way that makes him real, in a way that you can understand. Here's the beauty. You can look up. Here's the beauty of what I'm going to tell you, that Jesus can talk to you in ways that are undeniable. And you go, I don't even know if I can hear the voice of God. Nope, I didn't hear that, but you'll know. Says God, I, if there's a, if there's a you for me, bridge the gap here because it's not like I'm getting anywhere like I am. That is the most simple encouragement. Like you can't even get mad at me for offering that. Like if he doesn't do it, okay. I'm just saying, if you're at a place that you want to consider the nature of God, do it. He will find you. Lord, help us to take that into Christmas. Help us to take that into our families. God, as we wrap up the rest of this service, God, let us be a people who give, who reflect the love of God, who reflect the nature of Jesus, who is willing to come down and do the things that he did when he didn't have to. Pray in Jesus' name, amen.
God, we just thank you for today. We thank you for this season. God, this season of remembering all that you've done for us, sending your son Jesus to die on our behalf. God, his life wasn't taken away from him. He laid it down for all of us. God, so we just thank you again for this season. Let us not forget why Jesus came to earth. We thank you and we love you. Amen. Well, thank you all for being with us this week. I had a great time. Um, If you need prayer, you can reach out on social medias. You can email srccpray at gmail.com. Um, and, uh, and we're working on some other ways too. So that's, uh, that's a big priority here. So feel free to reach out. It's there for a reason. Um, Levi, tell them how they can give if they want to. You can give, uh, through our app or also through our website. Um, we try to make it as easily accessible as possible. And also just a friendly reminder, share the, uh, service with someone that, you know, if, if, if someone was on your heart while watching it, um, it just kind of helps build what we're doing here. So definitely highly appreciate it. Definitely. So yeah, reach out through the week on social media. We'll be there. Um, and we'll see you guys next week. So love people around you and bye for now. Bye for now.